Well, welcome everybody to our June Mini for Change events. Not really a lecture, no microphone, no slides. And back by popular demand, we have Renee Press from Fire and Earth Kitchen. And uh, we just were so excited about her cooking back in January. We had her back again for two yummy um, meals, and we get to try them out. This is very informal, so just chip in, ask questions as she goes along, and uh, uh, the event will unfold. So, welcome. Yes. Right. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hello. Uh, yes, so I'm Renee. This is my partner, Nick, and he helps all the group classes that we do. Um, I teach cooking classes, as I was just telling you guys, all around Puget Sound, uh, Whidbey Island, the mainland, um, all over town in homes and businesses around, around Seattle. Um, I also do personal chef services as well, trying to bring vegan, gluten-free dishes and make them more accessible to people. Um, today, we're going to just cover two pretty simple to prepare, some very summary dishes. These are actually, um, I know I say this a lot, but it's really true. These really are two of our absolute favorite dishes. This one, the chickpea the sea salad wraps. Nick will vouch for this. Sometimes if he's having a bad day, he'll ask me to just make like, a big bowl of the <laughs> Put it in the fridge when he gets on the fork, and he'll just like literally dig in. Um, and it's called chickpea the sea salad because it's like tuna fish, but made with chickpeas instead. So very healthy, protein rich, really, really, really simple to prepare. If you have a food processor, it's done in like five minutes. It's so fast. And anybody I make this for, they're just like, give me that recipe. So you guys are, <laughs> are really lucky that you have this. Um, it will probably, we're going to hopefully have a cookbook out by next year. So hopefully it'll be in there as well. But um, it's a really excellent, just go-to staple. You guys can keep it on hand. There's a little bit of vegan mayo in it, but you can leave it out if you want. The vegan mayo that we use right now is um, this new brand that just came out. It's called Just Mayo, and it's by Hampton Creek. And these guys are actually amazing. They're backed by Bill Gates. It's a plant-based mayo alternative, it has no eggs in it, cholesterol free, and they're trying to make it as accessible and as affordable as regular mayonnaise, more affordable even. This is on sale for $2.99. Um, it's amazing, it's complete, like I said, all plant-based, GMO free, it's just soy free, no dairy, no lactose, nothing. Um, it has made with pea protein, some canola oil, lemon juice, vinegar, I mean there's nothing bad in there, it's just, you know. So if you're using a little bit of it, totally fine. Uh, this and veginase are kind of our go-to brands right now. A little bit of mustard and then some key spices that we're going to talk about. And what gives it its flavor is going to be a little bit of seaweed and that's going to give it that kind of sea tuna fish feel. Um, and you, you can leave it out but it really does give it a nice a nice taste. Um, and then I'm going to show you how, a couple different ways you can wrap it up and have it be a super fast sandwich. Um, you can also put it on crackers. I serve it at parties on, on leaf, lettuce leaves like in a boat. And um, how else do we do it? Wrapped up in leave seaweed. It in a Big salad bowl and just eat it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can do that too. <laughs> the thing about it is, uh, the chickpeas are really high in fiber, so you kind of have to go slow because if you eat as much as I do, you end up regretting it later. Mm -hmm. it, it will ex kind of expand. That's true. Uh, yeah, the fiber builds up quickly. Right. And if you love this recipe, do double the batch because it, it'll go quickly. So we do that a lot. Um, so we're going to make this first. I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about cooking beans in general. So these are chickpeas that are made from scratch. So if you guys, I don't know how many of you guys are soaking your beans and cooking them from scratch versus canned. Um, I am actually, to be you know, t truthful and honest, I do buy canned beans. And no problem. I think that having canned beans on hand is totally fine. Chickpeas, they really do taste a whole lot better when you cook them from scratch. All beans do, but chickpeas, there's a huge difference, I think. Also with this recipe, what you want is the chickpeas to be ground up in the food processes so they kind of turn into crumbs. You don't want a paste like hummus. If you keep processing it too much, it'll you know, break down too much. And a lot of times when you buy the cans of chickpeas, they're almost waterlogged. And so when, even if you drain them and rinse them, it's just like the water's in there. So when you try to grind them up into a nice kind of coarse tuna fish-like crumb, it doesn't work. They've got to get it mushy. So I have a trick for that, which I'm going to share with you. Um, if you buy a can of chickpeas and you want to make this recipe, it's totally fine. Just put them on an oven sheet, like, like one like this, like a baking tray, and stick it in the oven at like 250 degrees for about 10 minutes, and it'll dry them out a little bit and get them to about the right texture that you want for, for, for if you cooked them from scratch. If you make them from scratch, not only is the taste and nutrition better, but you can also um, control the moisture content. So basically when they're done cooking, you just drain them, rinse them under cold water and they stop cooking, and then put them in a, um, a bowl or a colander in the fridge and they'll just dry out on their own and they get that nice texture. So that's what we're using today. Um, what we're gonna do first is get our two main ingredients in there that's gonna flavor the salad. So we're gonna use some red onion and we're gonna use some celery. Uh, if you are somebody who has a really hard time with 
like raw onion in your dishes, just you can do minimal. You don't need to put a whole lot in there. It really does just have a, it adds a really really nice flavor. Um, so it's a tip when you're cutting your onion. You have a question. Oh yeah. So now when you're cooking your chickpeas, yeah. How long are you cooking them? Oh on? yes. Yeah. Thank you for. Okay, so back to the chickpeas really fast. <laughs> Some more information about cooking your beans from scratch. When you buy your dried chickpeas, put them in a big bowl of water and measure them out. So this recipe calls for three cups of cooked chickpeas. That will be about one to one and a half cups of dry. I would do one and a half just to be sure because some expand more than others when they're, when they're soaking. So what you do is you put them in a big bowl like this, or the big one back there, and just the dried beans right in the bottom. <laughs> Cover it with water, fill it about three quarters of the way full with cold water, and then leave it on your countertop or you can stick it in the fridge if you want, and they'll expand overnight. If you happen to hear a weird popping sound in the middle of the night, that's your chickpeas expanding. <laughs> 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 popping. It's true. It took me like, I was like, what is that sound? Don't grab your gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like this little clicking sound. It's very strange. Um, and actually, when I was soaking them in the night, Nick came home and he was like, they weren't clicking, and then all of a sudden they were. <laughs> <It's really weird. laughs> So that's gonna happen. Um, and then in the morning, or whenever you do it, we like to soak them at night just because it's convenient, so before you go to bed, I'll jump out of bed sometimes, you'll be like, beans, like I forgot to <laughs> soak them. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and I go to the kitchen, put them in a bowl, fill it with water, and go back to sleep. Then when I wake up in the morning, they're ready to go. So the quickest way, I think, is to put them in a crock pot if you have one, and just cover it with water. When you get home from work, they're done. So super fast. If you're home, chickpeas are the fastest cooking of all beans, I think. They cook in about 45 minutes. Um, so once they're soaked, put them in a pot with water, just covering them by about an inch. You don't need a whole lot once they're, you know, absorbed all the water. And then turn it to high. When it comes to a boil, lower it to a simmer with a cover on and let them simmer for about 45 minutes to one hour. But you want to change out your soap water. Yes, thank you. Water. Don't, don't make use the soaping water. <laughs> You'll have very bad gas. Yeah, that's where gas comes from. <laughs> <laughs> yes. the hard way. <laughs> He cooked all his beans in soaking water for about a year. Oh, <laughs> or, oh, before he oh, learned. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. No salt. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Right, and no salt. No salt. No salt as well, yes. If you have trouble digesting beans, in general, even if you change out your soaking water, <laughs> you can add a piece of ginger to your cooking broth, or you can add a piece of kombu seaweed, the really fat kind that kind of comes in a strip, and just put it right in the pot with the beans, and it takes the gases out. Um, and if you cook it long enough, the kombu will actually dissolve and make the beans really, really nice and creamy, almost velvety texture. So you don't taste it at all, it doesn't taste like seaweed. Um, okay, any other questions on beans, cooking beans? Okay. So when you're, cooking, when you're cutting your onions, be really mindful that you're only taking off the outermost layer with the actual papery peel on it. You want to leave the outermost layer of flesh because this is actually where 70% of the antioxidants are. So if you take all that off, you're going to lose a lot of the nutrition. So just peel carefully. And we're just going to chop this up and bring it. Oh, thank you. Um, okay. And then you can just throw your red onion right in the food processor. And then we're going to put our celery in there as well. So I have two stalks of celery here. And I love this recipe because it's so fast. You don't even have to like chop much. You're basically just taking the ends and the tops off. I save all this for vegetable broth. And then you can just cut this really coarsely. If you have a good food processor, it's just going to chop it up into pieces so you don't need to go crazy dicing it or anything. But the red and the green give it a really, really nice color and flavor. So what I like to do first is just pulse this, just get it nice and chopped up. You're going for small pieces, not for it. Okay. So once it's pretty small, I'll do one more. Just use the rubber spatula to scrape down the side. So Renee, yeah. um, at your first cooking event, you gave a really nice narrative of what you do later with all those scraps. Yes. I wonder if you could maybe remind yeah, so people what you do. Absolutely, I will. Um, when I'm when I'm saving these, I actually take them, put them in a Tupperware like this, or in a Ziploc bag whenever I'm cooking for myself or for a client, and I save them. And then when the whenever this gets full, usually I'll put it back in the freezer and then I take it out. And when I cook, I add more to it. So mushroom stems, onion peels, everything is game except for 
um, maybe ginger heel, something like that that's really strong in flavor. And then when it's full to the top, or your Ziploc bag is full, just take it and dump it in a big stock pot, fill it with water, turn it to high, and let it come to a simmer. And then just let it simmer for about two or three hours, and you'll have a really flavorful, nutritious veggie stock. And you don't waste any of your scraps. So. Make sure it's well washed, but that's most things, the roots of the onions, the, the onion paper, all that stuff. Even beets, um, cabbage, all that stuff is excellent flavor. Potato peels, um, any greens, the stems from kale, if you pull those out, those are all really good. And then you can take and freeze it. Um, if you're not going to use the veggie stock right away, you can freeze it in little containers, even in ice cube trays, you know, anything that's going to get you the right quantity that you'll use. Um, but yeah, it's a really good way to, thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> it's a good way to use up all your stuff. So this is what it should look like. This is the, your small pieces of onion and celery. So nice, flavorful. I want to show the camera. Oh, sure. Uh, right, right there. Got it? Okay. And then we're going to add our chickpeas. So this is pretty simple. These are measured out. This is three cups here. I'm just going to dump them in. Just make sure they're not too wet, like I said. And then we're going to close this. to have small pieces, I'm going to show you guys again, small pieces of chickpea, but just right when it gets to a point, about the point where you don't see any whole chickpeas left and it's all only pieces, that's what you're going for. Some of the bottom will get more mashed up than the top, that's okay, just you don't want the whole thing to turn into chickpea paste or hummus. It's the texture that you want. So this is what it looks like. So it's kind of the texture of tuna fish or something. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to hold it right? Oh, yeah. Up. Up. Okay. Up. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. And then we're going to add our chickpeas. Just like that. 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 comes from a pinch of rosemary, and the rosemary is actually dry, and I grind it up in a spice grinder so it really imparts its flavor. Now, if you don't have, dried rosemary is easy to find, but ground rosemary is not, I found, for some reason. It's usually whole, and um, you can crush it yourself, or you, to make it really easy, you can just put some in a coffee grinder like this. So we're going to grind two things at the same time. We're going to grind some rosemary, which gives it this special flavor. You can't, I don't know, it's hard to place, you can't mimic it with anything else and if it's missing it's like something's missing but you don't know what it is so it doesn't taste overwhelmingly like rosemary but it gives it a really nice oomph. And then we're going to add our seaweed. So I use two different kinds of seaweed depending on what I have on hand. So I have some wakame here which is just uh, little flakes of wakame. Sometimes you'll see it in big strips as well. This is already pre kind of chopped up and if you put this in water it'll expand and get really big. We don't need to put it in water, we're just going to use it dry. We're going to put it right in the coffee grinder with the rosemary. You can also use nori, so this is just toasted that you make seaweed, uh, sushi with. And you, if you use this, just tear it up into little pieces so it fits in there, and then grind it up. And I like to just do that, and you can even just keep it in a jar, just do your own you know, ground seaweed. I used to, when I started making this recipe, I used to be able to find the spices powdered sea kelp at our store, and they stopped selling it, so I said, okay, I'll do my own. <laughs> so it's probably cheaper anyway. So put a little bit of, we're going to do wakame today, just a little bit in here. A little bit goes a long way. Uh, a tablespoon, though Nick always wants more. <laughs> so he likes extra seaweed flavor. And then we're going to grind it. Actually, it's a little bit more since Nick's here today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you all thank me later. You probably didn't have dinner yet. So going to have some. It's really subtle mixed in with this stuff. So yeah, even if you don't like seaweed, you, you'll like this. You will like it. We're going to grind it up. All right, and then we're gonna just take this, bring the bowl over here, and we're just gonna dump our seaweed, rosemary combination in there, okay? And then there's a few other spices, so we're putting a little bit of paprika. If you like some of paprika, you can put that instead. Paprika is actually an excellent, um, full of antioxidants. It's made from peppers, has all that red color in there. A little bit of turmeric, which is gonna give it some yellow color and also extremely good for you, um, anti-inflammatory properties. 
And we've recently learned that turmeric and black pepper are very, very good friends. Did you know this? I heard of that, but I don't know why. There's something in the piperin, the um, enzyme in pepper that makes it pepper, that combines with the curcumin in turmeric, that it actually amplifies, and a lot of people know that turmeric is very anti-inflammatory, it actually amplifies turmeric's uh, anti-inflammatory properties by 1,000 times. Wow. And we were like, really? And then Nick doesn't believe anything I say. It is. He researched it. <laughs> That's a made-up number. He said he said 1,000, and I was like, you can't tell people that in class. I said, no, <laughs> it's real. <laughs> and he ran it online, and he went and did the research, and it's confirmed. It is 1,000 times. There were all these studies. So um, anyway, the key is always put turmeric and black pepper together because it can't hurt, and everybody likes both spices. So just put a little bit of black pepper whenever you use turmeric. And um, <laughs> you'll get the maximum benefits. And we're going to add some sea salt. And a lot of people ask me what kind of salt we use. I use that uh, real salt. That the brand is called Real Salt, so it has all the minerals still intact. Um, and but I also use other kinds. I, in general, I try to stick with just sea salt and just look for one that doesn't have an anti-caking agent in it, just so I'm not eating that. And we're going to toss this together. I like to put all my dry. Uh, spices in first and just toss everything. It looks really pretty actually. Same colors with the green and the red and the green, all those colors together. And then one of our secret ingredients is nutritional yeast. So some of you guys might be familiar with this and some of you not. Um, it's very popular with vegans because it has a very cheesy flavor. It's actually an inactive yeast. It's full of B vitamins, especially B12. Uh, it has some protein in it and it, like I said, has a very nice cheesy flavor. So if you're into like uh, putting you know, people put Parmesan cheese on their popcorn or on their pasta, things like that. This is an excellent non-dairy substitute. Um, and one of the tricks with this, if you buy it, is to put a little bit of, whenever you use this, like say on your pasta, put a little bit of lemon juice with it. Because this has a cheesy flavor, but it's very monotone. If you add lemon juice, it gives it that like tangy zest that you get from cheese. Um, so those are, that's a good combo as well. So we're going to sprinkle a little bit of this in there. And this you can buy in any you know bulk section. They sell it at Whole Foods. Fred Meyer has the best deal on it. Um, they sell it in their bulk section as well. And we usually have like two pounds of it at the house. <laughs> we make our vegan mac and cheese with it, um, mac and cheese sauce. So stir that in. And then we're going to add our wet ingredients, so a little bit of mustard. Today we're going to use a little bit of the spicy brown. But you can use Dijon or whatever you like, just about a tablespoon or so. And then the vegan mayo. We're just going to put a couple tablespoons in there, just help bind everything together. Like I said, if you want to leave it out, you can just maybe put a little bit extra mayo or some vinegar in there. Um, but you guys get to try it today, so we'll just put a little bit. And you just stir everything together. It's just like making tuna salad, but more flavor and more nutrition. <laughs> and once everything's mixed up, it's ready to go. You stick it in the fridge and you have you know, your delicious chickpea of the sea salad for the week. So very fast. What we're going to do today is turn them into wraps. So I have some brown rice tortillas here, and I'm just going to very thinly slice some very pretty red cabbage, and we have some pickle that's going to go in there as well, and a little bit of red onion, and roll them up for you guys to get to try them. So these are some gluten-free brown rice tortillas, and if anybody here is gluten-free or experimenting with being gluten-free, these are really good brown food for life. We like them a lot. Um, so not a whole lot in here, just brown rice and rice bran. And we're going to turn on the burner, get that warmed up. I like to just, especially with gluten-free goods, um, just warm them up. A lot of times people are like, oh, they're dry or they're crumbly or something like that. Just put them in a pan or in your toaster oven and just get them warmed up a little bit because it really makes a big difference in the flavor. Is it like three, three out of five? I think four is fine. All right, so the rest of our ingredients are thinly sliced red cabbage. So we have this one cut in half. Red cabbage is excellent for you. It's um, very, very good at fighting cancer before it starts. Um, it has anti-carcinogenic properties. And I'm just slicing it really thin. I also love red cabbage just because it's so beautiful and adds a lot of color to dishes. So I'll put it in our red make sushi or on a sandwich or um, in like a spring roll because it adds so much, so much color. You don't need a whole lot, just a little bit. If you slice it nice and thin, it doesn't have an overwhelming cabbagey flavor. Although some people love the cabbage. <laughs> We're impressed by the thinness of your oh. slicing. So, so keeping your knife sharp is maybe you maybe should. Oh yeah, let's talk about the, let's the talk about keeping our knife sharp. Situation. So, um, we have. 
our knife honer here, we were just discussing knife sharpening, the key to slicing something thin like that is really sharpness of your knife and also practice and cook all the time so it gets easier. But in general, what you want to do is take your knife and just go like this at a 45 degree angle on both sides. If you have a knife honer, it's so easy. Just go like this every time you cook. And it makes all the difference in the world how thinly you can cut something, how much you can cut something without getting annoyed. <laughs> Um, it makes a really huge difference. So just like that, 45 degree angle, you don't have to push that hard, and you'll feel like little burrs on the blade kind of smoothing out. And it makes, like I said, a huge difference. Even if your knife isn't all that sharp, it does make it so quite so a bit when you So when you get your knives professionally sharpened, do they go deeper, or what's the difference of their... They, they have a grinding cheap, stone, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is kind of just a maintenance tool. Yeah. But, but it does make a huge difference. So. Highly recommend that. How long should you do that? How long should um, you do that? Just I usually do about that long, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, something like that. Um, just enough. If if it hasn't been sharpened ever or in a long time, you know, maybe do it for a minute <laughs> and um, see how sharp you can get it. But just test it. Test, you know, try to cut an onion before and then try to cut an onion after and see if it makes a big difference. When you're honing, you will feel it smooth out. It at first it'll feel like you're almost dragging across sandpaper or something, and yes. then all of a sudden it'll become much much easier. Wipe it off. That's true. Okay, so we're gonna put a little bit of red onion as well. So I'm just gonna not too much. We don't wanna overpower anybody. Just take off the peel, like I said, just the outer layer, and then we'll just slice it nice and thin. The key with also slicing thin and then thin and not hurting it. My knife is actually sharper now, um, but I just did that. <laughs> um, not hurting yourself is just using this claw grip. So. Hold your fingers in really tight and make sure you don't, you can kind of use them as a guide. Um, and that does just take practice to not, not cut yourself, so just go slow. And we have a little bit of a dill pickle here, so we're huge pickle fans, but pickle tends to be like very popular with, you know, tuna salads. So a lot of times it's just mimicking the flavors that you're comfortable with from your youth or whatever. So a lot of people have pickle in their tuna salad. So put a little bit of pickle in it and then you kind of mimic that same flavor that maybe you were missing. Um, and a whole lot healthier. So we're just going to put a few thin slices of pickle. And these are the really big, nice ones from the barrel. We got this at um, Central Market, which is by our house. So lucky enough to get these pickles from Oregon, I think. So over here. And oh yeah, don't do that. So <laughs> what I just did with the side of my knife to move the pickles over, try not to use the blade side of your knife. Just flip it over and use the back when you're moving things off your cutting board into a pan because it really, it does dull the blade as well. Okay, so a little bit of pickle. Our pan is probably warming up here. So we're going to get a tortilla in here. You can. Yeah, tortillas. Yeah, I'm just going to man the tortillas. So we're just going to put that in there just to warm it up slightly. Um, another wrap that you can do that's our current favorite is if you like seaweed. Some people aren't huge seaweed fans. If you do like it and you like sushi, use the nori seaweed to wrap your, your, your chickpea of the sea salad. So what you do is you take a sheet of nori and you'll spread out your chickpea of the sea on it about um, here, I'll take a sheet out so you guys can see. three quarters of the way. Just has everybody made sushi before? It's just like making sushi. So you're just filling up the three quarters of the sheet closest to you instead of rice. You're going to put chickpea in the sea salad, so it'll be like this, and you fill up about that much closest to you with chickpea in the sea. You don't want it to be too thick because it'll be a really difficult to roll, but just maybe half inch thick. And then sprinkle your toppings in the center, a line of cabbage, a line of onion, a line of pickle, and roll it up just like you would sushi. And you can eat it like a hand roll, completely whole. Wrap it in saran wrap, bring it to work, it's done. Or you can cut it into little slices just like you would sushi, and it's so delicious. It's such a good snack. So if you like seaweed, that's our current favorite. But if not, you can do it in the tortilla, put this on bread, but like I said, put it in lettuce, whatever you can think of. Um, it's excellent. And bring it to a potluck because people are gonna love it. Go fly off the table. <laughs> so put our seaweed back. Okay. So while Nick is manning the tortillas, we are gonna start getting ready for our spinach salad, and then we'll serve these up when they're ready. Um, so what we're gonna do is we are going to do our shiitake mushrooms first. So we're making a shiitake mushroom bacon <laughs> spinach salad. <laughs> so has anybody had shiitake mushroom bacon before? No. Okay, so what we're gonna do is take a shiitake mushroom, which is like this, 
and we're going to cut it. Now this is where cutting it thin and having a sharp knife will really come in handy because we're going to cut these really thin. And what you do is you cut them super thin, as thin as you possibly can, almost paper thin, but you don't, you know, if they're a little bit thicker that's okay too. Uh, but what you're going for is super thin. And you put them on a baking sheet and you drizzle them with olive oil and a little bit of sea salt. And all you do is you bake them in the oven at like 350, 375 degrees for about 20 minutes. And what's going to happen is they're going to shrink down to almost nothing. <laughs> you made these? No, but you can imagine. Yeah. They shrink down to almost nothing. It's like bacon bits, basically. And we don't know exactly how it works or why, but they really do taste quite a bit like bacon. It has to do with the protein in the mushroom, I think, and the salt and the fat from the olive oil. And somehow, the way these flavors combine, um, it makes a very delicious bacony crisp. And it's not like a strip of bacon, but little bacon bits that you can crumble on top of your salad or your burger or whatever you have in mind. Um, and this one, like I said, is just so popular, people go crazy for it. Um, so even I have people who tell me their kids won't eat mushrooms, they won't eat mushrooms, and they will eat this. <laughs> so I'm just going to move this out of the way so you guys can see what I'm doing here. So, and is this particular to the shiitake mushroom? It is. Or oh, okay. It is. We've tried it with cremini mushrooms, we've tried it with white button, and while they're good, it's still really good mushroom crisps. It's not mushroom bacon. <laughs> because the mushrooms have a lot of umami flavor, um, which is this like magical other taste that your mouth perceives. Mm -hmm. uh, shiitakes have a ton of it, so I think that when it condenses all the flavors, that's that's really what what does the bacon thing. So that's how thin we're going. Now there's a couple different things to know. You're going to be cutting a lot of mushrooms, so <laughs> because they they shrink down to so much that you actually end up with so little that you're going to want to do quite a bit. Um, so what you do is buy about a pound of shiitake mushrooms, and they can be expensive depending on where you buy them. There's a wonderful store called Lenny's Produce on um, 105th and Greenwood Avenue in North Seattle, and they have a different kind of shiitake. They don't look like this. They have um, it's a slightly different cap, and they have, they're called flowery shiitake, but they're much, much more affordable. They range anywhere from like $3.99 to $4.99 a pound, which is great. Um, most stores around Seattle, they'll be about $9.99 to $12.99 a pound. So it's they're a little pricey. Yeah. yeah. So if you go to PCC or something, don't be surprised. That's how much they cost. Um, but if you go to Lenny's, they are quite a bit cheaper there. A lot of the Asian markets also carry them cheaper. But you're going to buy about a pound of them, and then you're going to, and it will be worth it. So even when you're like, this is $10, <laughs> it's going to be worth it. <laughs> um, it really is worth it. So. The other thing to know is it's going to take you a little while to cut them. So I've gotten pretty quick because I have a sharp knife and also I've been doing making this for a long time. But as you go, just know that it's going to take you a little while. So don't do it on a night where you're starving and all you want is you have to bake it. Because <laughs> it'll take you like 20 minutes to get it made. Uh, could get it chopped and then a few, another 20 minutes in the oven. Yeah. So do it on a day when you have a little bit more time and you can just let them, you know, let it be your thing, kind of meditative. And <laughs> we have a metal baking sheet here that's very well loved, um, and what you want to use a metal sheet if you can. Uh, something like a glass tray isn't going to give you the same crispiness. Um, the darker the metal, the better. So the more loved, you know, this one has been like in the oven a million times. If you have a dark metal sheet that's been in the oven a million times, use that one because the darkness is going to get them nice and crispy. What is going to happen is you're going to fill up probably two trays worth. If you do a whole pound, you'll have about two trays. And each tray will make about a quarter of a tray of finished bacon. So they wow. really shrink down to almost nothing. Um, First, the, it'll start extracting the juices, and then the juices are going to steam off. And, and so you'll see, when you check your your, bake, your shiitake bacon and stir it around, you'll see it changing form every time you open up the oven. The first time you check it at about, yeah, check it at about five or seven or ten minutes and look at it and you'll see it'll have like a pool of liquid in it. They'll be losing their moisture. And then leave them in there, don't have to do anything yet. Once they start to dry out, the moisture will evaporate and they'll dry out a little bit. You'll see the ones around the edges start to get brown more quickly than the ones in the center. So at that point, you want to pull it out, use a spatula to just toss it around, mix them all up, and spread them back out. One of the keys to get them, get them crispy is to do them on two sheets because you don't want, you want two thin layers. You don't want one, you don't want them overlapping too much. A little bit is okay. But, um, so once you pull them out and you sp spread them around, put them back in the oven, and then they'll start to get crispy and you'll look in and you're like, oh, they're crisping up. 
they're not done yet. <laughs> and then you'll pull them out and you're like, I want to eat them, and they're still not done. <laughs> and what you're going for is really, really, really dark brown, almost right before they look like they're going to be burnt. But they're not burnt, just that crispy. So we're going to show you, we have finished, we don't have an oven here, but we do have finished shiitake mushroom bacon. And we're going to um, magically, this is like the cooking show, put this on the tray, and then show you guys what it looks like when it comes out. I'll do that. What do you want me to do with this? Um, I'll take that out and make a, I'll make a wrap now. So this is about how much will fit on one tray. So about that much, okay? So really spreading it out. And then you would have about two trays worth. And then Nick's going to pop those um, in the microwave just to warm them up a little bit and then show you guys what they look like when they come out, okay? And in the meantime, I, oh, so I didn't finish. What we, <laughs> what we do next is take your shiitake mushrooms and you're going to drizzle them with olive oil about a tablespoon. And we've tried different oils and they work, but there's something about the olive oil that gives it a really, really nice flavor mixed with the shiitake mushrooms. Now, I love olive oil, but I'm not a huge fan of using it in the oven because it has a low smoke point. So um, that means that if you put it at too high of a temperature, it will burn and the oil will oxidize and become partially carcinogenic. So you don't want to do that. So if you're used to roasting vegetables in the oven with olive oil, just make sure your temperature doesn't go too high. It varies depending on how refined the oil is, but um, it's usually about 350, 400 degrees. So just be mindful of that. If you want a good all-purpose oil that will take a higher temperature without burning, um, avocado is our current favorite. It goes up to about 500 degrees. It's delicious. It tastes like avocados. And you can get it at Costco or um, Goodies Mediterranean Market in North Seattle as well, and really affordable, so we use that a lot. Okay, so we have our toasty tortilla here. You're going to take your chippy of the sea salad, put it in the center. Oh, actually, actually, I should take this one. That's the finished product. So <laughs> it cooks for about 20 to 25 minutes. Wow. <laughs> so you can see the colors in here are really nice. We're representing purple and red and green. And what you want to do is just put a little bit more cabbage. Roll it up, just like you would a burrito. I tend not to roll on the sides just because it's a little bit crispier than all that. And then we're going to cut it. This one got a little crispy, but that's okay. Can you grab the toothpicks and then yes. some plates and we'll send these out? Whoa, I lost that one. I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> Creative wrap. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, we let it get a little crispy. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's okay. Mm -hmm. I don't think, maybe we don't need it. I think the, the, the crisp of the tortilla is a sealed deal. You can put another one in the pan. Yep. We have a couple here that survived. And he gets his dinner. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Front row here. I don't think this is the same. There is a new shape. Front row, baby. Tomatoes ready. So we have some 
organic cherry tomatoes. Um, we tend to buy, you know, whatever's on sale and what's available, but some of the things are more um, recommended to buy organic than others. We tend to buy organic tomatoes just because they're on that, thank you, you just said there, that dirty dozen list where, you know, 12 most contaminated um, dishes. So, not dishes, ingredients. So you just want to be mindful of that. And uh, you can find that list online if you're curious, but they have, tend to be the most heavily laden with pesticides and tomatoes are up there. They change it every year? They do change it every year. So I don't have two plates right now, but if I did have two plates, like ceramic ones, have oh. you guys seen this chick with the cherry tomatoes? If you want to chop your cherry tomatoes quickly, you can just put them between two plates and then use your knife to go through the side and mm -hmm. cut them all at once. <laughs> so. I'm pretty really sharp knife. <laughs> a really sharp knife. Yeah, otherwise. Lots of concentration. Not <laughs> All right, so we'll put our tomatoes in there. And then I'll make another wrap here. Do you want to show the avocado trick? Sure. Do you feel confident in your avocado skills? Absolutely. All right, go for it. So Nick's going to show you how to pick a good avocado while I make another one. Okay. So, uh, first thing is you like a lot of fruits. Avocado is, of course, a fruit. You want to find one that's kind of uh, soft to the touch. Uh, that means like not squishy, but it kind of just gives a little bit under the skin. Then the next thing you're going to look for, if you feel that and it doesn't feel hard or like it resists your, your thumbs too much, um, you want to take a look at this stem. And hopefully you're going to pick one that has a stem. And you want to pop it open. If it still is a bright green on the inside, once you pop the stem, then it's good to go. And you can take it home and it's ripe and ready to eat. Um, this one didn't have a stem, I assume. I, I pulled it out. Okay. <laughs> so people in my class always tell me, well, what if you got to the store before me? <laughs> and I always say, well, early bird gets the worm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you've got to find your own at that point. <laughs> Have a look at that point. Yes, yeah. I already took that stem out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I was wondering. Um, but yeah, these are both pretty good. Actually, this would be better. So then, Thank you. You take your knife. Oh, you want me to do that? Okay, so uh, slice in half. Uh, and for some reason, I always go around the tall side. You've got two halves, and to remove the pit, you want to gingerly and carefully maybe hold it in a way where you're protected. You just chop into your, uh, give it a little twist, it pops out. If you're really good about it, you can yeah, kind of flick it into <laughs> I don't know about the trash. Get your aggression there. Just get somebody to pull it off. So I've been using pliers incorrectly. <laughs> no hammer needed. <laughs> For you, my dear. Thank you. Uh, slices are you gonna We're going to dice it. You're going to dice it. So, yeah, if you want to dice it, you can dice it right in the shell. Dice it in its own bowl, and then it comes with a built in skin. Let's just get some of this stuff out of the way. You guys see that? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I always catch myself. <laughs> It's like, you just want to use that side and just tie yourself, don't do it. So shallot, same way, you want to peel off just the papery part. They're a little bit harder to peel than onions, I find, but it's worth it because the flavor is so nice and mild. They have a little bit of a good garlicky flavor to them. So just peel off the paper, and they give a really nice flavor to broth. So make sure to save it. Put it right in here. If you have any stickers on there, you can take those out as well. Let them play for your broth. <laughs> And then we're just going to get our skillet on the medium here and give these guys a quick slice. And this is basic, a really basic shallot vinaigrette. So we have olive oil going in the skillet. You just don't, like I said, you don't want it to get too hot or it will burn the oil. Put your shallot right in there. right now and this will be really only calls for one. Um, and then you're going to add vinegar, a little bit of sweetener, this is a basic vinaigrette, some salt, some pepper, and just have it nice and warm. So when you pour it over your salad, it kind of warms the spinach, wilts it a little bit, and then you can sprinkle it with your shiitake mushroom bacon. And everybody will ooh and on. You didn't do that much work. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty fancy, but pretty easy too. Um, it has a really nice, really nice flavor. So, and if you don't want to do the, the shallot vinaigrette, you could just do a, you know, do your favorite dressing, obviously. It doesn't matter. Even if it's pre-packaged, you'll still get a nice flavor. Even just olive oil and vinegar. Okay. sits a little higher than just the skillet size that's excellent for soups and for stews. Um, if I was going to recommend people to get one, I'd probably say get that size because that way you can use it as a skillet or you can use it where you need something a little bit higher. Um, you can use it as a pie, pie plate. As pie plate as well, baking right. the oven with it. They're really, really good, especially if you have a, um, if you have a mostly plant-based diet or somewhat plant-based. They just impart a little bit of iron into your food. So especially if you cook something acidic like tomatoes or a tomato sauce in a cast iron skillet, it leaches a little bit of the iron right into the food and you get that in your body, which is beneficial. So that's very, very, very convenient. They last forever. The only downside is um, taking care of them just so they don't rust. Just make sure you um, dry them really well. Don't use soap or it'll remove the nonstick coating that forms from the oils when you cook. And what else? I mean, if you want to get serious about it, some people like them to clean them with dirt, some people clean them with salt. Some people clean them with salt. Yeah, you know, I've, uh when I really have to scrub them from something being really cooked in or on there, uh, I'll use salt. I'll use uh, you know some coarse salt with just a little bit of hot water and I'll scrub the heck out of it. It comes off really easily. Mm. But then after that, I'll just usually wipe it out with a paper towel and oil it a little bit with like olive oil or canola or something, and that forms enough of a barrier. It's not really that hard. It's an extra two minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can refinish if you find it, if you have a cast iron skillet that's been rusted or hasn't been used for a long time or hasn't the best finish, you can refinish it pretty easily. You just have to scrub it down with a brillo or, or scouring pad and then rebake it in the oven with oil in it for about a couple hours, right? Yeah, it may smoke, but I think um, it'll probably be easier stove top. Yeah. They, um, they're great. The, the, recently though, so we've been using cast iron for the past five or six years or so, pretty exclusively. I, I actually don't have any other um, pans or anything, just these guys that we love and take, try to take good care of them. And then I, I had been cooking for this one client who had this ceramic nonstick, and I felt like I cheated. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came home one day with a ceramic nonstick, and Nick was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Confession. <laughs> And now 
now we use it sometimes. <laughs> I don't use it. That's he won't use it. <laughs> no, but they're convenient. The, the, so the ceramic nonstick, if you guys aren't familiar with them, they're really good. They're not expensive. Um, they don't have the Teflon coating on there, so you don't have to worry about it chipping off. And they really are. They're pretty nice. So if you're looking for a good kind of all-purpose, um, highly recommend those as well. So, okay, our shallots are getting nice and soft here in the olive oil. We're going to add the rest of our ingredients. So we have some uh, balsamic vinegar going in here. And um, balsamic vinegar is so, so good. If you, if you if a lover of vinegar, it's worth it to buy the really good stuff because it makes all the difference. Um, this is pretty, you know, standard table, but if you love it, get a nice bottle. Okay, so we're going to put quite a bit because it's really going to cover quite a bit of salad. And then we're going to put some agave syrup. You can put maple syrup, or just a pinch of sugar, whatever you guys are comfortable with. Um, I tend to use some agave sometimes just because I like that it's liquid. So whenever I make a sauce or, or in a baked good or something, I don't have to worry about melting sugar and all that. Just put it right in. It's convenient. Saute that, that together. We're going to put a little bit of salt and some pepper. It's really caramelized. Just let them cook on low heat for, you know, 20 minutes or so, and they'll get nice and soft. But they're still pretty good, even if you just do a quick cook like we did today. Okay, so then you're gonna pour it over top. You smell the vinegar? It smells good. Pour it right on top, and then just toss it with the spinach. Slightly. <laughs> okay, so that's about it. Just toss it together. I'm a I'm a dressing and sauce person, so I like to make it a little on the heavier side. But if you're not, you can put less. It tends to like it less, but that's okay. I'm cooking today, so <laughs> do what I want. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, we're we putting a little bit of everything on here. And then, do we have another? I know, I won't. Oh, here it is. This guy. And just so you got, normally I would put this in the salad and toss it all together, but I'm going to put it right on top so you guys can really taste it. Very colorful. Thank you. Ooh, Ooh. Sorry, don't want to start at the back this time. Yeah. It smells so good. It does. people showed that we were expecting, so you guys get extra shiitake bacon. Is <laughs> <laughs> that a little familiar Trevor going? <laughs> Are these things all readily available at mm -hmm. most grocery stores? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, think about the only ones you might have trouble finding. With, you know, most grocery stores should have all of this. Maybe the seaweed. I mean, most stores even have at least one special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the vegan mayo. You know, this one, they started carrying it. At, their mission is to get this in like every store in America. So Safeway has this now. Costco has this now. They have it on. I'm sure. There's, they have it in stores all over all over the country, um, and so that one's pretty accessible. You can find that at most places. Um, but everything else, I think it would be pretty pretty easy. The nutritional yeast, like I said, you can get a Fred Meyer. Um, they carry it there in the bulk section, and everything else is pretty pretty findable. If for some reason you ever have a hard time finding something on an ingredient on the recipe I gave you, you can just email me and I'll tell you where to find it. <laughs> How do the chickpeas compare to garbanzos? They're the same thing. Okay, same two thing. separate names. 
two names for the same, same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've never heard of chickpeas, but they look like garbanzos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I okay. think garbanzos is just more commonly used here. More advice, but um, yes. Yeah, there are thing. also some oddball chickpeas too. We'll, we'll call them. Uh, there's like black chickpeas, and there's other different types of chickpeas, but mostly that you'll find in like an Indian grocery. Yeah. They call them kalachanas, black, they're like smaller. It's actually two varieties of chickpea, and they're very, the big ones that we have here are the big kind of cream colored ones. Um, but they're, they're both really good for you. The black ones are very tasty. Um, they have a little bit more fiber in them and a little bit more nutrition, I think. And so if you ever see those, they're really good. This is really great. Good. You guys like the salad? Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. Good. The shiitake bacon, we use like, like bacon. I mean, it literally can go with anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we make right. vegan omelets with it, and you'll sprinkle that inside. Mm -hmm. um, you can do like Brussels sprouts on burgers. Yeah. I think when it comes to some craving, sometimes you want to crunch. Mm -hmm. and it gives that nice crunch. Right, but exactly. Yeah. yeah. Very satisfying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The reference. Way. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Yes. Very good. Good. Where can I check these in the grocery store? They will be, well, if the store has a bulk section, they'll be mm -hmm. in the bulk section, so you can buy them in bulk. Um, if they don't have a bulk section, they would be like in the beans aisle. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they'll be with like, um, you know, like where the tacos are, maybe the Latin aisle or something like that. The Goya section. The Goya. There's a Goya okay. section. Yeah. Chicken they'll beans. have sacks of beans. Yeah. There, hang out. Yeah. That's true. And you just want to rinse them yep. pretty well. Just, just put them in the water and let them, let them soak and do their thing and then rinse them really well. Usually about three times in between when you soak them and when you cook them. And every now and then you'll you'll find a few floaters and those are often bad. You can just toss them out in there. Right, if the chickpeas float to the top of this and to the bottom, if it's very rare, well, occasionally you'll see one that floats up, you can just toss it out. Oh. <laughs> it's like hollow inside or, you know, yeah. not, not fresh. Um, but. Yeah, there. It just you know you just kind of have to get into a groove of doing it, and then a lot of times you know people say, well, I finally just like started cooking beans, and then once you get in the habit, just doing it once a week. I like the idea of picking one bean or one grain and cooking that ahead for the week and having that in your fridge. So just rotate. The key with with eating well is just variety. So you know try to buy one new dried bean each each month or whatever or each week, and then soak that bean or grain and then cook it, and you'll find different things that you like. And, even now, we have so many, we've tried so many different things, and I just came home with a new rice the other day, and he's like, what is this? It's so exciting to have, like, you know, a new, just a new thing. Um, so just kind of get out of your comfort zone a little bit, try it. If you don't like it, then don't buy it again. If you do, then you have a new thing you can add into your, you know, kind of weekly rotation, which is, you know, we don't cook this stuff all the time. You know, we eat pretty simple most of the time, and then we'll add in more, you know, flavorful things. If we have friends over, it's the same thing. Um, we tend to eat, we eat well just because we tend to buy a lot of Whole foods ingredients, and I think that's the key, is just trying to get as many vegetables in your body as you can. So that's why I don't get too fussy with how you chop them, which direction, all that stuff. Just chop them up and get them in the pan so you can eat them. <laughs> so I say just get them in your body um, so that they can do their work. So you guys just have a whole lot of good nutrition going to your bodies right now. That's why I like teaching this class, is just seeing all this stuff. I'm like, that's going to be inside you guys. Eat it. <laughs> and make it taste good at the same time so you'll want to cook it yourselves. So. Um, good, good. So if anybody would like seconds, please feel free. You can come up and we'll give you a little bit more. There's a salad here. Um, and I did want to mention too that yeah. for recipes are over on the side from yes. today. There's a sign up list if you want to. She has a wonderful blog, beautiful comments, great food recipes. So you can kind of sign up for that as well. And there's a business card over there. But come on up if you want to take a look at things. And yeah, we have, um, and if you guys are interested in coming to any more of our classes, we have classes all throughout the summer, all over Seattle. I'll be doing two outdoor cooking classes, um, one in Carkey Park in August with our friend who has a solar-powered um, generator on wheels, and she's going to power our burners for us. So out wow. in the park right by the overlooking the mountains. Um, and that one is going to be on creative Japanese food. So we're going to be making sushi and chickpea miso soup and right out on the grass. It's going to be really fun. And then we teach a lot of classes on Whidbey Island as well, so if anybody wants to do a day trip and go over there, we have a class on Whidbey, um, actually a farm in Bed and Breakfast in Freeland, mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful farm, lots of animals you can pet, it's just fantastic, and she's going to be hosting a Tuscan summer class, so all Tuscan inspired foods, we're going to be doing pizzas on the grill, a um, whole bunch of things like that, so wow. really fun, and then we have an appetizer class in Finney Ridge um, in August as well.
and then more classes in the fall. Summer slows down a little bit because of more travels, but um, lots of classes in the fall and winter. We usually do average one to two classes a month, and they're all group classes, so you get to meet other like-minded people who are also trying to eat healthy. Um, it's really fun. People share house, suggestions. House yeah, and people, anybody who's interested in hosting, the way we teach is through host, uh, host homes and host businesses. So anybody who has an open kitchen, basically where people can sit around and look um, and can fit about eight people, you can host the class and take the class for free. And uh, you and your you know, family, basically. And then we bring, you know, all take care of everything. We sign up, bring all the food, do all the cleanup, and it's free for the host. So really fun. If you know anybody who'd be interested, has a kitchen that would work or outdoor space that would work, um, we're always looking for new homes, but we're booked out through the fall right now, so <laughs> things are good. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then the personal chef services as well, always available if anybody needs. Even once a month, I come in sometimes and I'll just cook a whole bunch of food and keep it for the month, and that kind of good supplemental meals. So those nights when you just cannot cook, you have something healthy in the freezer. <laughs> yeah. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> I try to focus on the education, but people say, please just cook, cook for me, so I do. <laughs> email list is over there. I send out one free recipe a week and class updates. So as the classes come out, new classes, you get immediate notification because sometimes they sell out pretty quickly. So. And yeah. you do caterings? I do very small scale catering on site only. So if it's like home party, a dinner party, something like that, and there's a kitchen on site where I can prepare the food, I will come and cook. Um, depends on the size. Usually 25, 30 is about my upper limit right now. We don't have a commercial space, so, so we're just trying to focus on getting the recipes out there and uh, traveling works really well right now, so that's how we're doing it. But I've had so many requests for vegan weddings this summer. Oh my gosh, it's so exciting! Yeah, so many people want plant based weddings, and I keep having to turn them away. So I don't, I'm not doing weddings right now, but um, but I'm happy that they're interested, so it's good. Yeah, people eating healthier. <laughs> we, we're actually soy free as well. Yeah, so that's cool. Soy, yeah. Yeah. All the recipes are soy free. Yeah. It's easy to overdo soy, too. Yeah. Yeah, these, these guys are doing really, really well. So they have they came out with the mayo first, which is so funny because we're like, mayo? Why? <laughs> you know, it's like mayo is not a huge thing, but I think it's because you can really easily take out, you know, the animal products that people don't notice or mind as much. But they're doing, uh, like, cookie doughs. Their big thing that they're coming out with, which I don't think is in the markets yet, is um, scrambled egg, actually scrambled eggs, which nobody has done yet because it's hard. Yeah. Why would you want to scramble something with, you know, solid egg? We do tofu, you know, we've done tofu scramble in the past. But apparently theirs is going to be pretty interesting. So we have not tried this yet, but um, you know anybody doing anything to just get other options on the market and people who are trying to eat less animal products is, is a good thing just for experimentation. So yeah, cool. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks, guys. Thank you.